Super Bowl 56 is coming up in just a couple of days, which means it is time to finalize your bet slips and get ready for Sunday's game between the Rams and the Bengals, which is what we are going to do here today. We're going to run through all the top props for Sunday's big game and let you know where you can find some value based on the odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook. This is covering the spread, our weekly sports betting podcast over on the FanDuel Podcast Network. My name is Jim Sadis. I am a senior writer and analyst for Number Fire. Dot com joined here by three outstanding guests to give their takes on Super Bowl 56. Of course, starting off with Dr. Ed Feng, my typical co-host here over on covering the spread. Ed, happy Super Bowl week to you. How you doing today? I'm doing great. Looking forward to talking about the game, talking about some props, talking about the excellent in-game decision making that Sean McVay will display in the second half of this game. <laughs> Never wrong, right? <laughs> Yep. Never done anything yep, exactly. to, to drive us crazy. That is for sure. Our other it two can't guests get worse today... than last game. So it'll exactly. Be, uh... <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. We'll we'll see about that. He might test Ed that theory for them. sure. Ed yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Our other two guests. Sensi. Yes, exactly. Second half money line Cincinnati Bengals. Our other two guests for today are JJ Zacharyson and Ryan Williams. You of course know JJ from his time here at FanDuel and Number Fire, but JJ's got some new kicks. He's over at LateRound.com and Late Round Fantasy. You can find JJ on Twitter at Late Round QB. JJ, welcome back to the FanDuel Airwaves. Uh, how is the new gig going so far? It's good. It's good. It feels like I'm like, you know, it's like a, a family reunion going on and I'm back home <laughs> hanging out with my boys. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to be back, excited to be talking about this game. I think it's a good one. I've seen some people yeah. say it's one of, like a boring Super Bowl. I think it's a really exciting Super Bowl personally. Um, a lot of narratives, but then on top of that, there's some really interesting matchups. Yeah, I mean, it's exciting players, which is kind of all I yeah. care about. Like, Aaron Donald is fun. Joe Burrow is fun. Yeah. Jamar Chase is fun. That's all I care about. So that's, and we that's can't, a good we, time. We, we sure. can't forget that it's a, a Pitt versus Pitt Super Bowl with, with Aaron Donald going up against Tyler Boyd, folks. That's a, it's, a, it's a very <laughs> University of Pittsburgh Super Bowl. Uh, do you not have a pit? Where? Why don't you have a pit football helmet behind you yet? Why is that? I know not there? it is weird. It is maybe I, I'm I'm kind of waiting to see what happens with Kenny Pickett in the draft, and maybe I'll have like a little Pickett shrine on one of these shelves yeah. once that happens. <laughs> Put that Patreon money to good use. We also yeah. have Ryan Williams here. You can find Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. Of course. No, Ryan, the host of our Monday Night Football uh, streams. He'd be on there with me breaking down Monday Night Football. Ryan uh, was also with us Sundays regularly to get you set for uh, the each slate of NFL. Ryan, appreciate you having you on today. How you doing? Yeah, man, we're we're doing well. We're doing well. It's fun fun to be here with the boys, as JJ says. Um, it's it's just a fun slate to dissect, and and I'm usually talking single game slates with you, Jim. So yep. uh, we got another one here, and all the de- all the props in the world that you could possibly <laughs> ever want. Uh, fantasy goodness here on the FanDuel Sportsbook. So we love getting after it. And it is going to be a blast. What we're going to do for today, we're going to go through basically kind of like market by market and let you know where we are finding value based on the odds over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Of course, if you are a new listener, this is our weekly sports betting podcast called Covering the Spread, which we have each and every week here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. We, of course, are live on the FanDuel YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Twitter pages as well. So make sure you subscribe there because we have live streams often on these channels, breaking down NBA DFS. We, of course, have uh, some betting streams as well. And, of course, check out Covering the Spread by searching for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Also, i got to let you know that with the NFL season down to just one more game with the Rams facing the Bengals, the big game going on this weekend, FanDuel is giving fans an exclusive way to get in on the action. All customers will receive a risk-free same-game parlay for the Super Bowl. All you have to do is go to the FanDuel Sportsbook and opt into the promotion, place a three-plus leg same game parlay on super bowl 56 taking place this sunday your parlay must be three plus legs and have final odds of plus 400 or longer to qualify if your wager loses you will get a refund and site credit head over to the fanduel sportsbook today and place your parlay the big game must be 21 plus and present arizona colorado connecticut Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Louisiana in permitted parishes only, Michigan, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Must wager in designated offer market. Bonus issued as site credit and is non withdrawable and expires to seven days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler. Visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1 800 Next Step or text Next Step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1 888 789 7777 visit ccpg.org slash chat 
That's in Connecticut. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789. Or in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. I can see JJ smiling because he no longer has to do those reads. Congratulations <laughs> to you on that. Let's dive in here to Super Bowl 56. Super Bowl 56 and start things off with the top level because how we view this game as a whole will influence a lot of things from a prop betting perspective. We think the Rams are going to cover that's going to lead us to different props than it would be if we think the Bengals are going to cover. So, Ed, I want to start things off here with you. We get the Rams as four point favorites over at FanDuel Sportsbook. They are minus 198 in the money line. Total is 48 and a half. What do your numbers say, Ed, about this game? Yeah, my numbers have uh, the Rams by five. I kind of see a similar game as to what we saw in the NFC Championship game um, in against San Francisco. I just simply feel like the – the Rams are better at throwing the ball and it's not that the Bengals are bad at throwing the ball and they are better than San Francisco 49ers at throwing the ball. But uh, the Rams were second when I look at adjusted passing success rate. <clears throat> Cincinnati was 11th. Uh, we all know that they're very explosive with, uh, and Joe Burrow's accurate and, uh, and that, that Jamar chase guy turned out to be a pretty good draft pick, but uh, he does take a lot of sacks. Um, we'll get into the, the pressure bit a little bit, but later, I just think the Rams are better at throwing the ball. So, you know, we could kind of see something like we saw in the FC Championship game, similar to the Bengals stick around um, and, you know, maybe even have a lead in the second half. But uh, Stafford and Cup, and uh, despite Sean McVay's awesome decision making, I, th I think they come back and, and win this game. I, you know, I bet Rams minus three and a half when this first came out. I don't think it's getting back there. I'd actually like to talk to John Sheeran why he still has this number at four. It's going to have some other places. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of other places are at four and a half. He's sticking pretty, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, I, I feel like they, when I've looked, I think it, I think FanDuel went to four and a half at one point this it week. It was four and a half so earlier long. this week. It was it four, went to four and a half earlier this week, and it was back to four, I think, Tuesday morning, Tuesday morning or, or Monday afternoon, I think. So, you know, I mean, Cincinnati is a respectable team. Can they win this game and be one of the most surprising Super Bowl cha champions ever? Sure. Of course they could. But I, I just don't see that happening. Um, I think the Rams get this done. And, okay. And, so, and they probably cover. So Ed has bet the Rams. JJ, what about you? What are your thoughts on the traditional markets to this game? Yeah, I agree with Ed uh, in terms of liking the <clears throat> the Rams. But I think the line uh, is, is fairly efficient. So I'm not mm -hmm. really keen on... Uh, necessarily betting the Rams side. I'm actually looking at the over under here at 48 and a half. And I, I you know, I talked to Ed earlier this week because I, I went on his show and we talked about this a bit. And I, I feel like I'm kind of on an island with this because a lot <laughs> of sharp people are on the under in this game, but I'm on the over in this game. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, yeah. uh, you know, Ed alluded to the fact that the Rams are uh, a, a pass efficient, their pass efficiency is pretty strong. They should be able to move the ball. You know, there's not necessarily a matchup that I'm like overly worried about for this Rams offense. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people are understandably and naturally looking at the Rams D line going up against this Bengals offensive line. That's mm. just not good. Like it's, it's not a great offensive line and it hasn't been all season long. Uh, but you know, the Rams D line obviously has these studs and they have Aaron Donald, arguably the most dominant defensive player of the last half decade. Uh, and then you have Von Miller that they added, you know, halfway through the season, and they're two guys that can obviously step up to the occasion and just go absolutely nuts and completely ruin this take that I'm about to throw out there. <laughs> but uh, the Rams numbers, if you just look at what they've done in terms of pressure rate, they've actually not been that good at pressuring quarterbacks. When I say not good, they've been a below average team at pressuring quarterbacks this season, despite the personnel that they have. Joe Burrow, though, he's in this interesting spot where uh, you know, it, even against Tennessee, against Kansas City, he wasn't pressured at like some absurd rate. It's just that Burrow uh, takes sacks at a really high rate when he is pressured. But going back to what the Rams do on the defensive side, if they do what they've done all season long over the larger sample and they're not able to necessarily get to Burrow, like I think is sort of expected in this game. Um, then, then all of a sudden you can see a scenario where Burrow has a little bit more time. Uh, he's able to, uh, you know, move the ball a little bit better. Uh, and these are, you know, at the, the bottom line, we know that offenses drive, uh, scoring and, and how games go down in the NFL. Uh, 
Uh, and at the end of the day, these are two offenses that have well above average quarterbacks, really good wide receiving groups and pass catchers. And I'm going to bank on that as opposed to banking on defenses, stopping these guys. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's really that simple. So I, I yeah. like the over in this game, you know, I don't think it's going to be like a shootout, but sure. Uh, you know, I, I do think that this line should be probably closer to, to 49 and a half 50 than it is at 48 and a half. Okay. Ryan, I heard you, uh, sounding like you were in agreement. Is that with the over here or the overall thoughts from JJ there? Yeah, most more so the over. I mean, okay, it, it's so go. it's so exciting to get the over on this matchup. I mean, and you you know me, Jim. Like I I hate rooting <laughs> for unders. Like just in it general, hurts, man. In, it in, hurts in, in every other way, shape, or form. And like like JJ was saying, like we have two explosive, high powered offenses here. I mean, literally, when you're looking at the props market, like. There are, I mean, say what you want about OBJ, but there are four guys that at wide receiver position that could go for 100 yards in this game. Like, there's just so many ways that this game could go bananas, like from an offensive standpoint, that 48 and a half that we're getting is just absolutely incredible. And I think that we might see it move by a hook, half a point. Um, as we get closer on, as, as people are betting this, but it, maybe it even goes down. I mean, like JJ's saying, like so many people, sharp bettors are talking about the under in this game. And like, we've looked at the tr the trends over the past couple of Super Bowls and, you know, the trends of the way the NFL is going with it leaning to an offensive game. And it's just not what we once knew uh, for the Super Bowl. And this is going to be an exciting one with explosive weapons on both sides. So I absolutely love the over here as well. I'm glad you guys are on overs because I have a lot of unders later on. So I'm glad you guys are having fun <laughs> while I am like going to be stressed the entire day on Sunday. So you're, you're living life better for sure. We're going to talk about some individual markets here in a second. But first, JJ, I want to go to you because we've had you here on Covering the Spread to discuss your player projection process for a full season. A single game is different. But obviously, there is some overlap. You've talked about how you have like a top-down approach, projecting out plays, pass run ratio, et cetera, et cetera. What can we take from that overall process of building out like season long projections and apply that? How, what what overlap is there between that and a single game player projection? Yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of people, uh, especially when it comes to player props, they look at raw data instead of rate stats and market mm -hmm. shares. Um, and so whenever you're building out projections, you're looking at at market shares as opposed to uh, you know, like, let's look at Cooper Cup, for instance, you know, you say, oh, Cooper Cup averages, what, 11 targets a game or whatever it is. And so therefore, he's going to see 11 targets again this game. Well, you have to you have to overlay uh, that notion onto what your team level projection looks like for this game, because there are often times where, uh, you know, you're facing a team that uh, runs at a slower pace. And then that's going to naturally bring your your uh, total number of plays down uh, from your uh, with, with your offense. Um, and so, you know, those sorts of things uh, can, can happen. And if you look at, at this game in particular, uh, there are two teams that uh, have been in neutral game scripts. If you're looking at just uh, game when, when games are plus or minus six points and have a six point margin, both of these teams have been pretty pass heavy this season. And the Bengals, especially during the last you know hand, a month and a half or so, they've really leaned more on the pass uh, because there was a stretched. Uh, during the season where everyone was yelling at Zach Taylor for being as conservative <laughs> as he was. And he's still been conservative, like on first down and such. But um, so w when you have teams, for instance, that uh, are naturally going to throw the ball a lot, this is another reason why uh, the over is kind of attractive to me is that when you have teams that when games are close, which is project projects to be close uh, when you have teams that are going to throw the ball a lot, that slows the game down in terms of allowing right. you to run more plays because it stops the clock during those incomplete passes. Um, and so you're really looking at it from that top level approach, as you alluded to, Jim, where, uh, you know, you're, you're looking at plays run from a team and a projected plays run. And then instead of saying instead of delegating and saying, oh, Cooper Cup's going to see 12 targets and OBJ is going to see eight targets and Van Jefferson is going to see six targets. You look at how they divvy up that pie typically and traditionally, regardless of game script. And then you say, oh, Cooper Cup usually has a 32% target share, OBJ, 25% target share. And you can take those target shares, overlay that on top of the game, and all of a sudden get more accurate target projections, which then you know spill out into how many yards they have, how many touchdowns they might have, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really, really important to look at things from a market share standpoint as opposed to a raw, raw volume standpoint. And one thing you mentioned there that I think is key for how I'm viewing this game in a lot of ways is the Bengals being pass heavy. Because I think the thing that sticks in our mind is Tony Romo yelling at the Bengals the entirety of the Chiefs <laughs> game saying they're being too conservative. And they were. They were 
They, their early down first half pass rate in that game is 57%. But over the past five games with Joe Burrow, it's 66%. That's a very high number. They have been pass heavy. It's been above 70% in three of those five games. So although like the Romo thing is like constantly playing in my mind, they have been pass heavy. I think that's important to, to keep in mind as it will dictate that we've used some other props. Okay, let's dive in here to this game. Let's start things off with Ryan. We've got a lot of markets here for this game. You can bet... Which team will score first? Uh, that right now the Rams are minus one thirty, Bengals plus one hundred eight. You can look at which team will score last. We can look at a lot of different things in the scoring markets. Ryan, where are you seeing value right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, well, I mean, let let's talk about just the touchdown scores. I mean, Mixon is is plus money to to score an anytime touchdown, and this dude has like taken over the backfield pretty much. I know people were tilting their face off last weekend with Samaj P. Ryan getting that screen pass and breaking it for a touchdown there. But like no running back is seeing carries in this backfield. Like Chris Evans is a special teamer now. Uh, Samaj P. Ryan's only coming in on pass catching downs. And even then we've seen Joe Mixon have 15 targets throughout this postseason. So they're uh, bringing him in there. So I love Joe Mixon props th- this week. Um, it, probably not his rushing prop straight up, but his yeah. rushing receiving prop. Um, is absolutely stellar. I think his receiving yards prop was 25 and a half. Um, I'm not sure if that's changed or not, but love getting the over on that. Um, and, and he just plus money for the star running back is something that I always tend to equate to, especially with the red zone role that Joe Mixon has as they get down there. They're trying to give him the ball. So love that. Yeah, Joe Mixon, a 44% uh, red zone share for the Bengals in his full games this year. That's a very high number for a running back. That number was plus 115. Uh, the Joe Mixon anytime touchdown is down to, to even money now. So clearly there are some people on Joe Mixon here and feeling the same way as Ryan there. What about you, JJ? What are you seeing early on in this game as far as the way you expect things to break? Yeah, so early in the game, there's some interesting data uh, with the Rams uh, and, and how they handled uh, their drives early in games and how the Bengals handled their drives early in games. The Rams were third best in the NFL this season on first drives this year, uh, and that's by that's that's looking at uh, yards per drive. So mm-hmm. not necessarily looking at, at scoring rate there, but uh, yards per drive, which is naturally going to be a little bit more uh, predictive than anything that's touchdown based because there's just more variance there. And then on first drives, the Bengals were seventh worst in in uh, uh, yards per drive, uh, and they were dead last in percentage of drives that ended in scores on their first drive. Um, and so you have these two completely opposite teams in terms of how they handle uh, things early on. And I think this this sort of plays into the narrative, right, where Cincinnati has been coming back in games, and they're these this, this underdog sc- story. Uh, where they're just constantly, you know, coming from behind and, and having these victories. Well, it's probably because they're getting off to these really bad starts and they're digging <laughs> themselves a hole. And the and the Rams are doing the opposite. And we've seen the Rams think about both San Francisco, or I think about the first San Francisco game, or sorry, the second San Francisco game, where San Francisco ended up uh, going on that run and making the then making the playoffs, where the Rams blew that lead. Uh, I, you know, the the Rams to me are in a really really good spot to score first in that in this game because of that. Uh, right now, uh, they're at minus 130 to be the first team to score, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think that's even though those, you know, you're not getting as much juice there. I think it, it's it's very logical based on how these teams have started. And then the other thing that I really like here, the other bet that I like is to take the Rams kicking a field goal as the first score result. Um, and, and that's at plus mm-hmm. 350 right now. Uh, and the main reason I say that is not only were the Rams third best in yards per drive on first drives but a lot of those drives at a, at a really a, a, a um a, what's the word i'm looking for at a disproportionate rate mm-hmm. uh those drives were ending in field goals as opposed to touchdowns then you add in the fact that sean McVay is not the most aggressive uh play caller especially you know on fourth downs in the world i i do think that the, that what i'm projecting here is the Rams score first it's a field goal they get off to a 3-0 lead and you get that bet at plus 350. So you get to fade Zach Taylor's scripted plays while fading Sean McVay's aggressiveness yes, it's at amazing. the same it's time. Perfect, right? It's perfect. With the Rams right. at plus 350, I like that. Now, the one early scoring thing I like is the first quarter total. That is currently at 10 uh, with plus 138 on the over. Now, I think the push odds here are very high. Um, so keep that in mind. It was nine and a half yesterday with even money on the over. I think at this current market, I'm okay taking it over here because I'm expecting a more pass-heavy approach for this Bengals offense than we've seen, which may combat, hopefully, 
the issues they've had in scripted plays, because that does include a lot of time earlier in the year where they were a bit more run heavy. So I think if I'm looking towards a scoring number early on, a non-full game market, I gravitate there, taking that uh, first quarter total over 10, which is plus 138 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Let's dive now into the, the MVP mark. And I can't pull this one up because I'm in New York and they don't like fun here. So I'm not allowed to bet MVP props uh, <laughs> at FanDuel Sportsbook in New York. So Ed, we're going to go to Michigan instead. Um, the uh, MVP favorites, I've been told, because I can't, I can't look, are Matthew Stafford at plus 120, Joe Burrow at plus 230. Any value in either of those guys for you? Any value elsewhere in the MVP market? What are you seeing that I can't see? <laughs> I mean, I, th- I think this market, I-, I really like Matthew Stafford. I think there's a lot of things about narrative that have kind of mm-hmm. gone against him. So, for example, mm-hmm. the fact that he's kind of reckless as a gunslinger and he threw a pick six in three straight games this year. And, and you walk around the greater Detroit area and you'll you'll hear Lions fans goes, oh, yeah, that guy threw seven pick sixes one year, man. He's just a pick six machine. Uh, that's actually not true, by the way. <laughs> but there is this narrative around him. Um and uh, I, I just don't think it's true. I think he's a really good quarterback, and I think they're going to do some really good things in this game. And I just – I mean, I think this came out earlier when I was talking about my bet on the side, but I, I just think Matthew Stafford is a better quarterback than Joe Burrow. I think the Rams' offense is better. I've not actually bet this market, but um, those – my numbers support that, and and I would definitely I, – I, I just think more towards Stafford and – you know, it kind of depends on what the historical rate is of, of quarterbacks getting right. this award. Um, mm-hmm. But I would lean heavily there. All right, Ryan, you're in Illinois. Again, a more fun state than New York. Um, yeah. What are you seeing in the MVP market? Any uh, any interest in a non-quarterback or what's your lean in this one? Yeah, I mean, I think Cooper Cup, if, if you think the Rams are going to win, I mean... <laughs> This this game just shapes up as like the Cooper Cup game. Like I, I I really like the Bengals plus four. If they go pl- if they go to four and a half, four in the I'm taking that. Yeah. But like just when you're talking about straight up, like he is so dynamic in this offense. Like he, even last week, like if he has a game against San Francisco where he is just ca- the catalyst of the offense, he finds the end zone twice. Like it's going to be so hard to not give this award to him unless Matthew Stafford goes out and throws two or more touchdowns, or maybe he runs one in somehow to other guys because if the work is going to Cooper Cup I think they're trying to give him this award we know that the MVP award is probably going to be announced tomorrow and it's going to go to a quarterback and they're going to they always try you know to to make ends meet right to make amends for missing out and he's (laughs) been the catalyst of this offense all year and I just don't see it the biggest stage of the game it's at home like this dude is going to show out and we know he has the rapport with Matthew Stafford. So I just think when you're looking at the odds and Matthew Stafford's plus 125, I might as well just get some action on Cooper cup at plus 550 because if Matthew Stafford is having a good game, the chances are that all of the work, if not most of the work is going to Cooper cup. So I absolutely love that bet. It opened at plus 650. So kudos to you if you got that action, but I still think there's value there to be had. I will say that Aaron Donald at plus 1500, 15 to one, like I know that's enticing a lot of people, but that is just like, you have to be expecting not only this game to go under, but yeah. like no exciting plays are happening in this game. We're getting the, <laughs> whatever that game was. What was it? Patriots and whomever, where it was 13 the Rams, to three. Yeah. Yep. Patriots, Rams, Patriots yeah. and Rams, of course. Right. How can I, <laughs> the Rams on the other side, of course. Um, so yeah, if we get an ugly game like that and he, you know, forces a fumble, gets a couple sacks, takes a t- there's so much that he needs to do to get that. I've seen a lot of people talking about that bet or getting action on that. And I just think that's, kind of negative EV when you think about what all needs to happen. Ryan, just trying to remind me of my son, Jared Goff's struggles in the Super Bowl. How rude. How rude. How <laughs> <Absolutely>. dare you? <laughs> all right, JJ. Uh, Ryan poo-pooed an Aaron Donald one. Can we talk you into a, t- a Tyler Boyd MVP uh, bet <laughs> to, get, to get the pit love going here? You can't, but but close to Tyler Boyd, if you're going to bet the Bengals side, because obviously that means the Bengals are going to win the game. Mm-hmm. If you bet the Bengals side, I'm going T Higgins at plus, he was oh, plus okay. 6,000 whenever last time I checked main oh, reason God. for that. Um, it's just, I mean, the odds are, are pretty insane first off uh, with it's 60 to one, but uh, you know, the reason I'm looking Higgins instead of like a Jamar chase is because the gap between the two uh, from an odd standpoint is just too large. T Higgins mm-hmm in games that he's played with Jamar Chase this year, has out-targeted him in 10 of 17 games. Uh, it wouldn't be shocking if they utilize Jalen Ramsey quite a bit on Jamar Chase in this game. I don't know if we're going to see like 
straight up shadow coverage, but sure. I'm, I'm sure we're going to see Jalen Ramsey on Jamar Chase more than we will uh, on T Higgins. That could open things up for T Higgins a little bit. Uh, and if he's seeing more work or if he's seeing equivalent work to Jamar Chase, you just need a little bit of touchdown fortune uh, to sort of uh, shift the narrative to go to T Higgins uh, as opposed to Jamar Chase. So I think it, the, the reason I like Higgins so much is because if the market is saying, uh, I don't remember what Jamar Chase was exactly at, but uh, if the market is saying that he was at like plus 1500 or, right. or 2500, 2, 2, yeah, 2, 2, 2, 2, yeah. yeah, right. That compared to T Higgins being at plus 6,000. I mean, it's just, it just seems like too big of a gap to not try to take advantage of that when realistically, you know, I think it's like more of like a 55, 45 proposition between the two guys and who outproduces who. And with Ramsey, they've not used him to shadow for most of this year, but right. they did during the playoffs against Mike Evans when right. it was very clear that Mike Evans was the guy you had to stop. And T. Higgins, uh, he's awesome. But like the guy recently has been Jamar Chase. So if they were to use Ramsey in that way, it'd be more likely to be on Jamar Chase. And that leaves T. Higgins versus some more vulnerable cornerbacks uh, for the Rams. So I think that that line of thought is valid. And you could also think about that with the receiving yardage props too. I think that could translate yeah. to that department as well. If you're looking at a chase under, maybe I'm not going there first, but you could think about that or Higgins over as well. Yeah. Let's... And I, I should add, I should add too that I, on the, on the Ram side, because I think the Rams are going to win. I am on Cooper cup, just like Ryan is. I think that, you know, if, if they end up winning this game, mm-hmm. you know, that Cooper cup is going to have a, a monster monster game. So it's kind of tough to, to get away from them. Absolutely. Okay, let's go to the touchdown scorer prop. Ryan is on Joe Mixon. I think Joe Mixon is also very enticing. A bit shorter now than I'd like it to be, but I think there's still some value there if you've not gotten it yet. Ed, let's go to you. We can bet anytime touchdowns, first touchdowns, multi-touchdown games. Mixon's also uh, shortened there. He was 6-1. to one. He's now 5-1. to one. Where are you seeing value in this market, Ed? Yeah, I mean, Jim, this is not really a market that that I'm getting into with the, with the touchdown scoring, so... Um... I'm going to take a pass on this. We'll we'll talk a little bit more about quarterbacks later. All right. What about you, JJ? What do you see in this one? All right. So here, here's a take for you guys. Okay. This is is a little, little take. (laughs) Sounds good already. I like to have a little fun with it, with, you know, first touchdowns. Why not? So I already (laughs) alluded to all the stuff that I talked about earlier with the Rams being uh, in a a, a lot better position to score first than Cincinnati Mm -hmm. based on how they handled their drives and their first drives. So I think the Rams are going to score first in this game. I do think that, that the first, points will be a field goal but maybe it's a touchdown maybe even they take a 10 nothing lead uh mm-hmm. against cincinnati so if you look at the Rams side then the obvious go-to would be a, a cooper cup but i think it's fine if you want to bet cooper cup for first touchdown but i'm also looking at the exact same logic that i just used with the mvp discussion with jamar chase uh versus t higgins and i'm looking at van jefferson versus obj <laughs> right van jefferson since obj got to la Van Jefferson has nine red zone targets. OBJ has 11 red zone targets. Van Jefferson within the 10 yard line has four targets. OBJ has five targets. That includes the playoffs for the record. So they're being utilized not far. I mean, yeah, OBJ gets utilized more heavily in the red zone and closer to the end zone, but it's not that that dramatic. And if you look at what's gone on in the playoffs, yes, we've seen a lot more production from OBJ and Cooper Cup than Van Jefferson, but from a routes run standpoint, uh, Van Jefferson is right there running just as many routes as these guys are. He's just not being targeted at, at, high, at high of a rate as he was in the regular season, uh, which is partially variance, but partially because obviously OBJ and Cooper Cup are just better. Um, but the fact that he's on the field and running routes in those 11 personnel sets, which they run so much 11 personnel, we know that Van is going to be on the field often in this game. On top of that, Jim, no Tyler Higby. There's no Tyler yeah. Higby likely in this game. I haven't seen the a report yet that he's officially out, but if Tyler Higby's out, that's just one fewer pass catcher, uh, reliable pass catcher that Matthew Stafford can look to. So I am on the van train first touchdown score. Let's do it. Van Jefferson, 16 to one at the sports book to be the first touchdown score. He is actually, he has longer odds than Kendall Blanton and Tyler Higby. Yeah, that is where we get a little outrageous. Also, yes. for like <laughs> single game DFS, Van's salary is a thousand dollars lower than Blanton. That's pretty wild too. So yeah. people hating on Van, and and here's the other thing with Van too is that I think a lot of it is just recency bias based because in yeah. the playoffs he just hasn't seen. Well, he's been uh, hurt, but he's had tar- two weeks to yes. rest now because he had that shoulder injury and then the knee yep. injury. But he's had two weeks to rest. Exactly, he played through the knee injury in the conference championship two weeks to rest. I think that if you're trying to get in on Van Jefferson, there are reasons to make that a logical play. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. 
Okay. Uh, Ryan, you mentioned Mixon at uh, even money for an anytime touchdown. Anything else in the for you in this market? Uh, let's see. Anytime touchdown. So, yeah, the Van Jefferson call, absolutely incredible. Love that, JJ. Uh, <laughs> that's going to be one that I'm going to have to be enticed by. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody feels kind of appropriately priced. I do. Yeah. Um, so, I think we're getting Daryl Henderson back. I think in some right. capacity, <laughs> right? It, that's yeah. that seems to be the trend, but I don't really know um, how much he's going to play or whatever. I do like Sony Michelle to at plus two forty yeah. um, to to have an anytime touchdown. I mean, I get listen. I I, I stray away from bringing up Cam Akers uh, because I'm <laughs> I, I'm following or connected to so many people in Dynasty who like <laughs> will throw picket fences and torches at my house. You're going to get blocked on Twitter about Cam like, Akers. immediately. <laughs> I I am, but you know, and and I think that he's a, a great player, but the facts speak for themselves. Like they run a committee here. And how many times have we seen it pretty much since Todd Gurley's been there back? Like these, they're just comfortable with running the hot hand, running the best guy out there. And Sonny Michelle has looked great. I mean, resurgence from when he was at new England, like he has the trust of the offense and he holds on to the football. So like if things aren't going the way for cam Akers early in this game or, or what have you, even when they get in the red zone, Sonny Michelle's seeing work. So I love him. Uh, at plus 240 to get an anytime touchdown in this game. Yeah, the dynasty players Ryan is alluding to, please mute the rushing uh, prop yeah. section when we get there and pretend I'm not talking uh, <laughs> yeah. once we get there. Same. With yep. Sony Michelle, though, uh, back in the conference championship, Michelle played 14 of 18 snaps from 12 yards uh, from the goal line and in. So he was on the field when they were near the goal line. And that was true even when Cam Akers was healthy. He missed the second quarter due to that shoulder injury. But none of those snaps near the goal line occurred. Or sorry, that's four out of six uh, from the 12 and in in that time. None of those were during the second quarter when Akers was getting checked out with his shoulder. They just preferred Michelle in the high leverage spots after Akers lost those two fumbles versus the Buccaneers. I think that's legitimate. He also came in a lot. Um, on third downs, which means Michelle's going to be on the field, probably going to play 40-ish percent of the snaps. I think plus 240 is pretty interesting. I actually was going to bring that one up too, Ryan. So I think we're on the same page here. I like uh, I like that for sure. Okay, let's move now to the passing yardage prop. Ed, you said you might like some stuff over here. Uh, we have uh, Joe Burrow and Matthew Stafford both uh, slated for 36 and a half passing attempts. Minus 106 in the over for Burrow, minus 114 for Stafford. The yardage favors Stafford, 281 and a half to 276 and a half. Where are you seeing value over here, Ed? Yeah, Jim, I'm, I'm disagreeing with you on this one. Uh, I actually uh -oh. like I like Burrow under his pass oh, attempts. No. <laughs> this has been a very common one <laughs> oh, with uh, Adam Levitan over at Establish the Run. Uh, their models think that the attempts for Cincinnati have been uh, just, just a little bit too much. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, they, they have been throwing the ball a little bit more on early downs. I was actually looking at, over at RBSDM mm -hmm. a little bit earlier today, and they were at one point significantly below league average passing mm -hmm. on early downs. They're actually above average now, uh, a little bit more recently. Um, I guess I just don't trust Zach Taylor either. I think Probably fair. That <laughs> he might go back to running uh, Joe Mixon a lot. And uh, yeah, I, I had... I had the under on Burroughs pass attempts. I think it was 38 and a half against Kansas city. And he was at like 11 at the end of the first quarter. And all my friends are looking at me like, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, I hate betting it under. And then we, we get a little bit later in the game and uh, it won. It actually yeah. won because he only had to throw two pass attempts in overtime. Um, but yeah, I'm. I'm actually on the under here. I, I understand the some of the data against it, but uh, yeah, I, I, that's that's one I have. With yeah, Burrow. he was at 37 after overtime. So you uh, <laughs> won it despite <laughs> overtime by a, a uh, an attempt and a half there. So Ed is on I, the I under for the had, pass attempts. I think he had 38 total. Okay, so you actually got it by the. Okay, yeah. So you uh, yeah. you squeaked under there. Although honestly, went to OT. You should have won anyway. So um, uh, good call. I I, I, I I but all right should have lost that, but. You get a little lucky. They added some explosive plays yeah. towards the end. Yeah. Um, the uh, <laughs> it was it's it's actually really fun. Uh, it's actually really not fun uh, cheering for these uh, under pass attempts. It hurts because you're like, yeah. oh, that was incomplete. Oh, that still counts as a pass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> luckily, sacks don't count as pass attempts too. Correct. So if the Rams can generate a pass rush, uh, that can potentially help as well. 
Yeah. Uh, the reason I like the over here for this one is in part because we talked about how they've been more pass heavy recently. Also, they've been pass heavy despite playing a lot of games outdoors. They've played only two games indoors the entire year. And passing efficiency tends to increase when you go inside. And they're playing inside for the third time this year. Maybe that encourages Zach Taylor to be a bit more pass heavy. Obviously, I'm putting faith in Zach Taylor, which is... <laughs> It's it's a thing. Um, we'll see how that goes, but uh, I think that we'll see how, how the Bengals play this one. JJ, what about you? We talked about how your process revolves around a top down approach. What are you seeing in the passing props here? Yeah. So the other thing to keep in mind with this game. So let's just pretend that uh, the Bengals go into this game uh, and they are worried about the pressure because I think that even though the numbers say that the Rams haven't generated that much pressure, I think it's only logical to think that the yeah. Bengals are aware of Aaron Don Donald and Von Miller staring at them on the other side of the ball. Yeah. Um, and, and so as a result of that, I could also see them taking more of that like West coast style approach, uh, getting the ball out quickly. Not, not, not only that, but the Rams allowed a 15 plus air yard throw at the 26th highest rate in the league this year. So they did not allow a lot of, of uh, 15 plus air yard throws or a lot of throws down the field. And they were 24th in completion rate allowed there. So they were also very good at stopping those types of throws. So if we're not seeing as many chunk plays like we see out of the Bengals offense often, uh, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, we could see those shorter attempts convert a little bit more um, and, and then go with that approach a little bit more. So I'm in this really weird spot with these with, with, with these passing numbers because I could actually see a scenario where the over hits on attempts but the under hits on yards and uh, you know, the, the passing yardage number for Joe Burrow um, you know, he he's actually hit that under 10 out of 19 games this year. The Rams have allowed more than that uh, in, in eight of 20 games this year. So, I mean, from a matchup standpoint, just like what they've done cumulatively across the season um, you know, it looks good for, for Burrow to hit on the under there, but I'm just intrigued by the over from a pass attempt standpoint, because I think strategically it just makes sense. And the numbers sort of bear out in terms of just how the Rams defend the pass. I was going to see if I could same game parlay <laughs> that. Uh, but John Sheeran said, no, 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 you dummy. You don't want to do this. These don't correlate well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, That's the thing. Yeah. It's very awkward, right? Because usually <laughs> you would want to, usually you would not want a same game parlay, something like that, because of volume thing and you want more volume. But I really could see a scenario where the, the under hits and passing yards, yeah. but the over, you know, maybe Joe Burrow gets like 40 pass attempts just given their approach in this particular matchup. We talk about responsible gaming in terms of like not betting outside of your limits. This is responsible gaming and like, hey, Jim, don't be an idiot. Don't parlay these <laughs> don't be, together. So. Yeah, don't, don't parlay it together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I appreciate you, John, that. Too. Yeah, thank you, John. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Uh, passing props. Anything catching your eye there? Yeah, so I mean, we talking about the Bengals side. Let's talk about the Rams side here and Matthew Stafford, who is at two eighty one and a half for mm -hmm. his passing yard prop. I, I love this to go over. I mean, when you're talking about what his numbers are at home here and just him having to force the ball or, or pass the ball and and the what I said about the running game it, is that it really, you know, can't be trusted. You're loving what the Cincinnati Bengals have done during this postseason run, you know, 83 yards to Josh Jacobs, but they, you know, were able to contain a banged up Derrick Henry to take that as you will tread with a grain of salt, but I mean, still it's Derrick Henry. And right. then last week it's the chiefs, you know, Clyde was there and Mixon or excuse me, McKinnon, but uh, those guys really didn't run as well either. So, I mean, if we don't, if we get them containing Sony Michelle and Cam Akers and a banged up Daryl Henderson, like I love Matthew Stafford to just take the ball into his own hands. And if this is a competitive game, which we'll talk about some uh, fourth quarter props probably later on, but uh, I think it'd be a competitive game throughout. So we, we know what he does. If it's close in the fourth quarter, he's going to be slinging on, on early down. So love I, getting I'm excited over for the problem. end of this, Ryan, because we talked to, we have a spot where you can talk about any prop you want. You've already said you're going to talk about a kicker and or potentially talk about a kick <laughs> I, you're talking about fourth quarter right, props you're uh you're gonna have some fun i'm looking forward to that for I sure am. let's I slide am. it over to the receiving yardage props and stick with ryan on this one because i, I think yeah. that there are some interesting dynamics at play you talk about odell how he has that upside i didn't think he did uh he made me look very silly for that last week where he had over 100 yards uh for the first time with the rams 62 and a half. This number has been all over the place. It was 64 and a half. It went down to 61 and a half. Back up to 62 and a half now. A lot of movement there. So clearly interest in the Odell markets. Ryan, what are you thinking here on the receiving yardage numbers or receiving props in general? Where are you seeing value there? Yeah, I mean, if I like 
Stafford to go, you know, over 281 and 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 some change. You know, I gotta like these props here on the guys. I think that you know the tag on Cooper Cup is going to have people, you know, stray away 105 and a half. But I mean, like, okay, I, I'm I'm happy to take that. You know, <laughs> right. only 110 on the juice. But I mean, when you're looking, then you know, you go down. Okay, so Odell's at 62 and a half. He said that in back to back games. I mean, his first 100 yard game since I think he was, you know, first in Cleveland. I think. Um, in 2019, that was his first 100 yard game since then. So he's definitely, you know, getting up to par here. Um, he should, uh, he he'll he'll go against a a tougher matchup potentially, but I I still like him uh, to hit that over prop. And then JJ, you know, bringing up the Van Jefferson uh, thing, I thought I was going to be the only one talking about Van Jefferson, but I do <laughs> like Van Jefferson uh, for the longest reception at 17 and a half. Um, this is a number that he's also hit qu- quite a bit um, throughout the regular season and a couple times in, in the postseason as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, love love getting action on that. And, and what's hilarious about this is it's juiced to minus one twenty two. You know, so it, he's the he's the uh, favorite to hit the longest reception of all these. And then you're looking at his uh, his total yards prop, and that's thirty three and a half. So I think it's interesting to get some action on on those props. And I don't want to steal DJ's thunder, but T Higgins, I'll, I'll give the floor to him on that. But sixty nine and a half, if you think that he's going to, you know, uh, get on the other side, avoiding Jalen Ramsey coverage, um, I think he's he's apt to hit that more often than not. Let's let's do a JJ here. Um, Van Jefferson over 17 and a half for the longest reception or let's over go, 33 and a half yards under two and a half receptions. Cause that's the Van Jefferson special. It's a 41 yard bomb <laughs> yeah. catches nothing else for the rest of the game. I think that's right. the, uh, the, the one we could go with there. So Ryan teed it up for you, JJ, any T Higgins love. Uh, where are you looking at here for the pass catchers? Yeah, I like I like both Higgins overs. Uh, just for the for the reason I talked about earlier. I mean, he he technically has out targeted Jamar Chase in, in ten of seventeen games so far this year that they've played together. Um, you know, I I I, I don't want to touch a Jamar Chase uh, bet here just because uh, he's so talented. And I right. you know I I could sit here and make an argument for an under, but I I just don't want to because he could also have one hundred and fifty <laughs> yards because he's a freak. Um, so I'm gonna lean on Higgins there. Uh, and, and, uh, go that direction, but the Van Jefferson thing, man, uh, he's at 33 and a half receiving yards is over under as, as Ryan alluded to, he, he's one of those types of players that can get that in one play. And it's, right. it's nice to, you know, we're not talking Jarvis Landry here. Uh, you know, it's, it's nice to have that, uh, in your back pocket where you're sweating it in the fourth quarter. Hopefully we're, hopefully we're not, cause he's going to score the first touchdown, right? It's going to be a, <laughs> a, four, a 41 yard bomb to, yep. to Van Jefferson for the first score. Um, but he's actually hit that number in 12 of, of, of 20 games this year. Um, you know, they run a lot of 11 personnel, as I noted, the most in the league by far. That's sort of like the McVay special. It's what he sort of like forced and introduced to the league uh, a lot more whenever he became head coach. And then no Tyler Higby. I mean, I, I yeah. think it just is logical yeah. that Van is going to pro- like I from a projection standpoint, Van should probably see 12 to 15 percent of the team's targets in this game with with no Tyler Higby and it, it has room for growth there too. Um and so I think as a result of that, uh and in an efficient offense, uh going the over at 33 and a half just makes a lot of sense. So Van during the playoffs, while playing with Tyler Higby and while playing banged up, which he may be less banged up this time, is a 9.4% uh for his target share, but he has 24% of the deep targets. Yep. Uh like he still is tied with Odell for second team in deep targets, despite being banged up to play playing with Higby. So I think that your projection, you know, 12 to 15% is probably correct once we adjust for those factors. Okay, Ed, let's go to you here. Um, you were talking about some Kittle props uh, two weeks ago. We were texting about that. Um, what are you seeing uh, for this one? So you, you brought up the Kittle prop. Let's uh, let's talk about that. So a okay. um, couple weeks ago, uh, I saw, you know, we went over to Fantasy Pros, checked out their projections, uh, saw that Kittle's projection was over. The market and it's like oh yeah you know I, I think you know there was this idea that he was hurt towards the end of the season and he was coming back off that so so i bet the over however what i didn't understand was that these projections which are mean projections are different than what the market values should be so um because the market value is more like a median right so half the yeah half the half the results should be over half the results should be under as long as you're juiced in the same way 
And um, so I was talking to Colin Davey last week and he was talking yeah. about the differences between market values and how the medians and the me <coughs> medians are different. And that got me thinking about some work that I did about a hundred yard rushers. So I did some work thinking, how do you get to a hundred yards in a game? And my hypothesis was that you get more carries towards the end of the game. And that's how you get to a hundred. That turns out to not be true. Uh, about 53% of yards and 53% of carries happen after halftime. But when I looked into it, 40% of the yards for 100 yard rushers came from the top two plays. And so you're getting to a hundred because you're breaking explosive plays. And I've talked before about how explosive plays tend to be pretty random, but the more important point here is that explosive plays really uh, make the mean higher than the median. Uh, those, those, those explosive plays really kind of stretch that out. And so to, to look at Kittle and, um, uh, is yard to, to look at Kittle's projection and to think that it was immediately and over without going to a calculator like the unabated prop calculator and calculating actually what those odds should be was a mistake. Uh, ignoring Jim Sonis' advice on it also <laughs> was a mistake. I learned my lesson. No, so I didn't, anyways, mean, I didn't bring it up for that. I brought it up because it meant you were looking at receiving props. You didn't have to say what happened. <laughs> What? No, I <laughs> you lost. to say what happened. I was an idiot, and I tried to redeem myself. Uh, anyways, over on the blog, there's there's uh, there's an article called "The Right Way to to Look at Super Bowl Props." So, anyways, <laughs> go check that out. Um, so uh, what does that mean? So, anyways, I, I applied that a little bit here, so I yeah. got a little bit smarter. Um, I actually have a little bit on Cooper Cup under 102 and a half yards. Uh, that was kind of based on this analysis. Good looking at fantasy pros doing the calculator uh in general when you talk to pro sports bettors they have a lot of unders in these games yeah um and cooper cup under also i think correlates with my van jefferson over thank you jj zacharyson <laughs> and then uh, also i have a little bit of a jj zacharyson thing for this game too i actually took a little bit of t higgins under because he's had a lot of yards the last two games and this is uh, JJ two years ago. I uh, really like Raheem Mostert under his yardage total for the Super Bowl. Uh, one of the easiest bets I've ever had the pleasure <laughs> of watching. One of the one of the more fun under bets to ever watch yeah. in the Super Bowl two years ago. Uh, I think there's a little bit of I, – I think T. Higgins is a talented player. I mean, it, it's it's hard. I mean, this guy's a second-year player. And, um, yeah, so anyways, I have a little bit of under there. Uh, a lot of the projections are under – a lot of his mean projections are under 69 and a half. And uh, so I took a little bit there, um, which kind of goes with my uh, I don't trust Joe Burrow as much. And I think he could get sacked quite a bit. Um, yeah, you so. mentioned uh, Colin Davey. He wrote a post up about like the process of, you know, why that matters. Uh, projections and stuff. He, he used the example of like Zach Levine assist props. Um, that's over at Betscope. Uh, if you right. search for Colin Davey on Twitter, True. you can find that over there. It's a really good piece. Like I recommend reading it because there's a lot to learn from. Yeah, it's real. It, it is very good. I would just say, like you know, there. Um, please go check it out because Colin's great. But there, the like the difference between the market and the mean is like like a half an None. assist. Yeah, like yeah. For some of these yardage props, they they differ by like five yards. Jamar Chase um, is ten yards off. Yeah, ten, um, I mean it's eighty. I think not, his projection is eighty six yards hmm. at number fire. Okay. So like so I mean I, like it's just yeah. these distributions are so wacky for football. Mm -hmm because of those explosive plays that that just just be cognizant of it yeah for sure so uh go to the power rank uh because that's where ed wrote a piece about that for football from that perspective as well and check out colin's work um with regarding to basketball props there as far as my stuff here we're gonna start off the bummer notes uh on the receiving props here and go with the the cam Akers under two and a half receptions it's minus 174 so Sorry if you want a plus money prop. We're not going to play that way right now. Uh, minus 174 under two and a half because of the role Sonny Michelle had on third down during the conference championship. And again, this is before Cam Akers got hurt. For the game, Michelle played 14 of 18 snaps on third down. Akers played just three. So yeah, Cam Akers could get an early down pass. He's, he got a couple of those in the divisional round, one from Odell for like 40 yards. Uh, but two and a half receptions, you need three to go over that. That seems a little rich for me for a guy who may not play on third down. So I think that I want to go Acres under two and a half at minus 174, which leads me into the rushing props. Let's go over there at FanDuel Sportsbook and start things off with Ryan. We've been talking about Acres, talking about Joe Mixon. What are you seeing in these markets over at FanDuel? 
Yeah, I'm going to cheat a little bit because I kind of alluded to this before when we were talking at the beginning of the show and the rushing and receiving props that happens to be under the rushing uh, tab there for those who are looking for it. And you're looking at Joe Mixon at 87 and a half. He's gotten 100 yard, 100 total yards in consecutive games here. I do think that they will try and get him going for all the conservative talk that we're talking about, Zach Taylor. That comes to the benefit of Joe Mixon, like getting him the ball, uh, trying to get him the ball in space, hopefully in this team, if JJ's talking about if they do implement somewhat of a west coast offense and try to just get the ball out quickly that could go to him we could really hit him hit that receiving prop which actually we didn't talk about that but it's over 24 and a half yards um there so i do like that to go well over um and and kind of balance out his rushing prop he's coming in at 60 and a half um it seems fair uh, when you look at how things have been going. But, I mean, this this defense has really been stout against the run of late, really not letting even total rushing um, hit this prop. In the in the Tampa Bay game, I believe there was only like 51 rushing yards. Most of the work came from Fournette catching it out of the backfield. Um, and, and just really stellar last week, again, against uh, Eli, Eli Mitchell and Debo Samuel. But, I mean, those guys are just so explosive. But I, I could see Joe Mixon possibly getting there it's just not one that i'm gonna bet so that's where i'm getting the leverage is the rushing and the receiving uh to to balance it out and that number has moved a lot that i don't know if like if you're if people watching the stream notice but i like jumped when i refreshed this tab and clicked on this because that number i think was at 95 and a half last week it was at 90 okay. and a half an hour ago and i was talking i was on the fantasy pros podcast earlier today and I said, keep an eye on that market because if it goes down more, because it's a 90 and a half at that point, I said, if it goes down more, I'll take the over. And it went down more. It went down three yards in, a, in, a, in, a, in an hour. So I think now Love it's it. gone too far. Looking at Joe Mixon, uh, he's at 98.7 uh, yards per game in his full games this year. Now we got to go through what Ed was talking about, where the mean number does not necessarily mean that the median is going to get there as well. So recent games for Joe Mixon, again, yards from scrimmage, uh, 115, 105, 76 under, 86 under, 135, 60, 68, 54, but 163, 123, 110, 91. Like he goes over this number pretty often. 87 and a half to me, I've been staying away from this market. I think now is where you buy back in, get to 87 and a half on Joe Mixon. I think that's a good way to go. I also do like the Cam Makers under again. Sorry, uh, Dynasty people listening. 83 and a half is the number for Cam Makers <laughs> again, because my concern with the rushing prop for Akers, which is 65 and a half right now, is if the Rams go run heavy to counteract the approach the Bengals had during the conference championship game where they were dropping eight into coverage, maybe the Rams say, okay, you're going to do that. We're going to run. I'm worried that that could lead to an over an acres rushing prop, but the rushing plus receiving yardage prop gives me another route for betting against his third down roll. That's why I want to go there. So I think I like the over on Mixon under on acres. I think that's where I want to go uh, with regards to the rushing yeah. props. JJ, what about you? What are you seeing on the, on the, with the backs here? Yeah, look, I I'm on all of the cam acres unders in this game. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I, I love cam acres. Uh, I think he's really talented. Um, but you know, I, I talked to Ed about this earlier this week where when you're projecting backfields, you have to actually like place yourself in the minds of coaches because unlike wide receivers who are seeing volume based on uh, getting open, they have to earn those targets that they're getting running backs just have to be on the field and the coach has to say, Oh, we want to get him the ball, right? You just want to hand him the ball. Uh, and, and what we saw with, with Cam Akers, he has that that uh, wild card round where he looks really good coming off the injury. Uh, and we're like, wow, he looks really explosive. They're probably going to give him the ball a lot more in the divisional round. And they did give him the ball a lot more in the divisional round where he saw like 96% of the team's running back rushes against Tampa Bay. But he also fumbled twice. And they were key, key fumbles in those game, in that game. And so then what happened? Well, he sees like half of the touches the next week. Only has a 3% target share. Uh, against San Francisco going from an eight target share against Tampa Bay. Um, and so, you know, there, there's something that you can actually pinpoint and, and focus on and say he fumbled. The coaches took notice. They didn't utilize him as much in the, in the NFC championship game. And then on top of that, Sony Michelle has experience in these spots, right? And he's been very solid. He's just a rock solid running back. Uh, and so I, I think that they end up just leaning on Sony Michelle uh, similarly as they did this past uh, game uh, against San Francisco and, you know, it's, it just makes for Cam Akers uh, and, and those unders to be a little more attractive. Yeah, I agree. It's a bummer, but I <laughs> <Yeah>. agree. <laughs> what about you, Ed? Are you going to pick up the vibe here and go some overs, or are we just all in on the Akers unders here? 
No, we are definitely all in on the acres. On the <laughs> and one thing that JJ actually didn't didn't talk about on the football analytics show earlier this week was we didn't talk about Daryl Henderson. That right. yeah. he might be healthy. Yeah. And just getting one or two carries, three, four, I don't know, could yeah. uh could also help with the under as well. Yep. Yeah. Uh Acres rushing plus receiving is 83 and a half. His rush attempts is 16 and a half. The under there minus 130. Rushing yardage 65 and a half with minus 110 on the under there. Across the board. Sorry, Cam. We'll bet on you for overs next year instead. Okay. <laughs> Ryan, we teased it. We're opening up the board. What else are you seeing in terms of uh good bets over at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, real quickly here, uh, I also <laughs> wanted to talk about, and you're still on the page, so Matthew Stafford, over five and a half rushing Oh, yards. baby. All right. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I, I, I want the guys to, to, to get behind this or, or, or laugh or get on me, but this is where it becomes fun because he's hit this in the playoffs, I, I believe, in every game in the oh, postseason, wow. and this is a guy who seven times in the regular season rushed for negative yards i mean we're getting pretty much he was only taking qb kneels at the end of games and that was his rushing yards but now he we've seen him in the postseason we've talked about okay everything's on the line like if matthew stafford needs to lay it out or get a first down or something like that we could see this guy take off if cincinnati's getting pressure absolutely love that i think uh patrick mahomes Derek carr and ryan Tannehill have all hit this bet against cincinnati um so absolutely thought that was interesting to get on that number i wish it was i wish they were giving us plus money on that they're not so but something to monitor as we go into the game but all right let's talk about the game props here so if you go into the super bowl uh the super bowl props not actually the game itself but you have to go on to super bowl uh 56 and go into the game props we're talking about the fourth quarter we're talking about the second half i think we do see a back and forth affair Will both teams lead in the second half is plus money on yes at plus 158. Both teams to have a lead in the fourth quarter is plus 280. And if you think there's going to be a fourth quarter comeback, which just means the winning team trails in the fourth quarter at any point in time is plus 260. I think if we do get in competitive game, if it is a one scored game going back and forth there, I love getting plus money on this game at the end of the game. I don't see, I, I really don't see the Bengals being involved in a shootout, but or being involved in a blowout, but maybe it could happen. I think that if the Rams are winning big, we've seen Joey B, the comeback kid, come in and make things interesting as of late. That is where I'm really trying to get uh, plus in on the market there and even you know even for the people who are rooting for unders hey you can root for the under and just have it be a close game this is not anything to do with touchdown scoring you can get a field goal from mcpherson or matt gay and that's all i'm gonna say about the kicker props uh okay because they are absolutely inflated jim they're inflated <laughs> this week i wanted to get some action on matt gay but both of those guys are inflated i think they're over uh seven and a half points and and they both have hit that but it's it's minus 30 minus 130 or something. Too something much steam on the like kickers, that. man. What a weird Super Bowl. What a weird Super Bowl where people are I, hammering I these it. kicker props and taking no, away Ryan's fun. Coaching decisions, man. Yep. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> All right, Ed. Uh, are we, what are you going with here? Anything else you're seeing the uh, value? Yeah, for sure. So I'm actually really interested in these interception props. And, you know, usually um, you think about interception props and you think, oh, let's just look at a quarterback's interception rate and project forward. Uh, that doesn't work because pr- interception rate's a pretty noisy statistic. So a couple years ago, uh, I did some work and found that it's better to look at a uh, quarterback's bad ball rate. So that's essentially interceptions plus passes defended. Passes defender are all those situations in which a defender gets a hand on the ball or jars the ball loose with a hit and – it turns out that bad ball rate, so the sum of interceptions plus uh, passes defended, is very sticky, almost as much as completion percentage. And so you can use that in this game. And so I went back and I looked at uh, bad ball rate, and Matthew Stafford has actually been pretty good uh, over the the last couple years, and he was particularly pretty good this year. Uh, he has been better than NFL average when he has uh, when you look at his bad ball rate. And that's something that gets really hidden in his interception numbers. I think he had, he had a 2.8% pick rate this year. We already talked about the pick sixes a little bit early, uh, a little bit earlier. Um, and Joe Burrow, you know, he didn't have a great pick rate this year, uh, 2.7, uh, 
But he actually had an even worse bad ball rate, uh, 13.8%. And that is significantly higher than the 11% NFL average over the last couple of years. So when you look at uh, the Burrow pass attempts, you can put together a quick little model of how many, you know, the probability that he's going to throw a pick. Mm -hmm. And based on some pretty conservative assumptions, I think there's about, my numbers suggest there's at least a 60% chance that he's going to throw a pick. So that means if you can, you got to look at the price for what Burrow over a half Mm -hmm. interceptions is. Um, But I I bet it at minus 130 at, at BetMGM. Um, yesterday, this is probably my favorite bet of this game for Joe Burrow to throw a pick. Uh, his bad ball rate has been pretty bad. And, um, oh, oh, I should talk about Stafford as well. So when you project out Stafford, um, I'm roughly seeing about 50, 50, whether he throws an interception or not. Um, so that's going to, it depend. obviously depends on the price, but, uh, 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 you can find books out there that'll probably give you plus money on Matthew, uh, Matthew Stafford under ha- a half interception. Ed, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Did you not bet Jared Goff to throw a pick a couple years ago in the Super Bowl and he threw it on like the first play and you like won your bet like immediately? <laughs> Am I misremembering that or was that something else? Yeah, that sounds good. I'm sure that happened. <laughs> <laughs> sure, rubber stamp. Okay, JJ, what, do you, what else are you seeing here at FanDuel Sportsbook? Yeah, I got, a, I got another player prop for you. I'm going Jamar Chase over four and a half rushing yards. Oh, he's, he's, okay. Okay. He's, he's, he's at four and a half rushing yards. He's averaged, he averaged 0.4 rush attempts per game in the regular season. But what we see in the playoffs is uh, players and teams getting more aggressive with their playmakers pretty often. Uh, and in the playoffs, Jamar Chase has seen three, one and one rush attempts in three playoff games. So he's averaging far more uh, rush attempts than the 0.4 that he averaged per game during the regular season. So if he gets one rush attempt, which he's, that, that's the way they've been utilizing more in the playoffs. I think it's logical too. It's not just like a, a recency bias type thing. I think they're just trying to get him the ball, which makes sense because it's Jamar chase. If he sees one rush attempt, he can hit the over uh, on that one rush attempt. So uh, I'm going to hit the over on Jamar chase over four and a half rushing yards. All right. That's actually moved down to three and a half now minus minus one twenty two. Oh, so the juice has moved there okay. too, yeah, getting yeah. a free yard, but you're paying a little bit more juice. I think that that's sure. a, a that's worthwhile fine. trade-off there for Chase. And again, if he gets one rush attempt, you're probably going over that number. Okay. We're going to finish up here by going around the horn and asking everyone if they had one bet to make on Super Bowl 56, what would it be? JJ, we're starting things off with you. You have one bet to make for this Super Bowl. Which one is it? Van the man. Van Jefferson go. over 33 and a half receiving yards. All right. We talked about that before. Assuming Van is healthier, Tyler Higby not being out, that benefits Van. So Van over 33 and a half. Ed, what about you? What is your favorite bet for this year's Super Bowl? Ed, you're on mute. I like Welcome Burrow back. to throw a pick. I hope it happens in the first play. And uh, <laughs> we'll let everyone on Twitter know. Um, yeah, I mean the bad ball stuff is pretty predictive. I've been, <laughs> yeah, it's been, uh, it's been uh, something I need to actually use more for for some of these prop things. But um, uh, yeah, I like I like Burrow. It's it is now thing. canon that that Ed did have that. I don't know if he did, but we're gonna pretend he did have the Jared uh, Goff one. No, I feel uh, like I had. No, I'm trying to think about this. I feel like I had like maybe Brady not to throw him last year. That might have been that it. Doesn't... That that might have been it. Because um, I don't think we were doing this show with in that the golf super bowl that's true yeah we were right. not um we did do it though two years ago uh when someone named jj zacharyson said patrick mahomes is scored yes. the first touchdown at 20 yes. to one yeah. and he did so that one did happen i know it's van for sure. van this year baby let's go so van at 16 to one even more likely uh based on the odds to be the Which first is crazy to think about scorer. it's crazy to think about that, that it that, was 20 that, to one yeah yeah it's insane yeah Ran an option to Daryl there uh, to Damian Williams, I think, and kept it, and he scored. Yep. He had like a ro- long run right before that and didn't score. I was like, oh man, I was thinking about like JJ hitting this prop, and then he hit it anyway. So that was a very uh, lucrative Super Bowl for me. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, Ryan. Uh, high expectations set by these two guys based on their past track rec- track records in Super Bowls. So no pressure. But your favorite bet for the Super Bowl. Huh. Uh, my favorite bet. Uh, let's go with Cooper Cup here. I'm gonna go with Cooper Cup. I didn't talk about this, but Cooper Cup over eight and a half 
uh, receptions yeah. at plus 110, I believe it okay. is. Um, I just feel like it, it, it's shaping up for it to be a pass funnel for the Rams, uh, and, and he's going to be a part of that. So I love getting action on his props, and any ones that I can get plus money on, I'm going to take that. So over eight and a half receptions. And uh, right that away. one is one where you don't need him to bust off any long plays. You just need him to be right. him, basically, Volume. based on you know yep. what we've seen so far this year. My favorite bet for the Super Bowl is, again, sorry, Cam, uh, under 83 and a half rushing plus receiving yards for Cam Akers. It's minus 114 on the under. I just think, again, the third down roll overblown. Daryl Henderson may be back here. I think you add those factors together, and we do get an under here for Cam Akers. So sorry to be a buzzkill, but that is my favorite bet. <laughs> for Super Bowl 56. And that's all we have here for this Super Bowl 56 preview, live preview on covering the spread here on the FanDuel YouTube, Twitch, Facebook, and Twitter pages. But if you want more prop talk, do not worry. We'll be back here on the YouTube, uh, Twitch, Facebook, and Twitter pages on Friday with Jessica Gridiron and Brandon Gandula breaking down our favorite bets for Super Bowl 56 once again here in the same places. Also, again, make sure you subscribe to covering the spread Wherever you get your podcasts, Ryan, want to thank you first. Find Ryan on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W and check him out right here, same place, uh, to get all of his live streams. Ryan, good luck to you in Super Bowl 56. I'm rooting for these running backs together and uh, hope things go well for you. I appreciate that. No, thanks for having me. It was fun chopping it up with the guys. Absolutely. JJ Zacharyson's on Twitter at Late Round QB. You can check out the Late Round podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, and check out LateRound.com. JJ, good, continued. Good luck with the good site uh, or with the new site. Congratulations on the new venture and good luck to you in the Super Bowl this weekend. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Uh, Ed, we talked about JJ and having him on your podcast. Where can people find that podcast and all of your work? Yeah, check it out at the Football Analytics Show. I mean, JJ go all the way back to the late round QB ebook and being hired at Number Fire and uh, and the decision to go independent. So we we spent a lot of time talking about that. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about Sean McVay too, and then a, a lot a lot of really good fun stuff. So uh, it's it's a, it, you know it's a different kind of show than this. I mean, we yeah. we it, it, I mean we clearly talked about the Super Bowl and and. Uh, JJ's take there, but uh, a little bit more about uh, the fantasy football world and his story. And you get good food takes on the, the football analytics show too. So that's always a plus <laughs> as well. You can find Edward Ed's work at the powerrank.com and find him on Twitter at the power rank. I'm at Jim Sonis, J I M S A N N E S. Our DFS single game preview will be tomorrow, Thursday, 10 a.m. on the fans of YouTube, YouTube page and up on the number fire daily fantasy podcast feed after that but thank you all for tuning in good luck to you with super bowl 56 have fun enjoy the show we'll talk to you once again next year this has been covering the spread right here on the fan duel podcast network 